All right, I, uh, I think that's enough time here. We'll, uh, we'll of course, probably have some more people joining, um, but all they'll miss is, is me talking here for the first minute. So um, again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. So excited to have uh, Chris Day and Dustin Daniel on from Dubosky and Co. in Calgary. Um, Chris and I, as it turns out, used to work together. Um, and uh, and I know he's a great guy and very pragmatic. And and Dustin is his partner. And uh, and we've we've met and and uh, enjoyed some time together as well. A little bit about Aiken Henderson. Um, so we're a CPA firm in Calgary. We operate a little bit differently. We're uh, we're in it for your success, for private company success. And you'll see uh, that everything we do is is to try and help uh, private companies out and help get information out to them that's uh, really useful. Um, and so, without further ado, um, we'll give you the we'll give you the disclaimer that basically says everything we're about to tell you might be wrong, and so just take it as is. Just kidding. I mean, we're going to give you good information, of course, but um, there's our disclaimer. And what I will do is I will pass it over to Mr. Chris Day, who's gonna who's gonna do an intro here and and get right into it. So. Clayton, we wanted to start with thank you. Thank you, Aiken Henderson. Thank you, Ronnie, and thank you, Clayton, for having us. Our function um, uh, here today is to be respectful of your time and share some learning and tie back in uh, private company advice and uh, some tax advice from the great folks at Aiken Henderson. Uh, Dubosky, very quickly, our purpose and our history. We were formed in the mid 80s. Uh, since then and now, we have been in the service of private company owners, entrepreneurs, family run enterprise. Uh, we would serve the emotional and economic protection of these and those people that take the risk of those employers that uh, create and fund private companies and uh, the financial instrument of life insurance uh, and insurance at large is uh, is how we uh, practice. Um, so I will move on um, to the next slide. Um, so if you'd like to connect with uh, Dustin Daniel or Chris Day, uh, we are on LinkedIn. Uh, we're on Dubosky.com and uh, we'd be happy to uh, be connected with you there. Uh, Clayton, uh, for your um, folks that are on the, the learning session today, uh, Dubosky has a uh, an economic relationship with uh, Dr. Peter Anderson. Dr. Anderson is a US based economist who for a number of years worked in Canada uh, PhD writer about business and uh, we are in possession of the Anderson report which we get monthly and we'd be happy to share that with uh, those folks on the call on a monthly basis. Our subscription agreement allows for this and uh, Dr. Peter Anderson uh, certainly before and during uh, our new business environment uh, writes about the US and Canadian business condition. Um, so that's available to your, you folks on the call. If you wish, please drop us a line on LinkedIn and we'll get you hooked up with the subscription. OK, we're going to get into the uh, the case study of a legacy service company. And again, our function here is to learn about corporate owned or corporate held life insurance. And I'm joined by my business partner, Dustin Daniel. And uh, Dustin and I work here in the Calgary uh, area. Uh, Dustin has been with the firm about uh, 10, uh, just over 10 years and uh, has been in the service of private companies, entrepreneurs, family run business for that time. Dustin's a holder of the CLU uh, designation and is an exam away from earning his uh, TEP accreditation. Clay and Dustin will join in as they see fit to, uh, to help out with the explanation of legacy service company and the case study there too. So a bit about them from the human side, uh, two successful entrepreneurs, both married, um, both uh, are in their late 30s and both sets of families have uh, two young children each. So owner one and owner two, Rosencrantz owner one, Ophelia number two. So they are 14 years into this venture. They started their careers together and uh, it is their plan to finish their careers together. So this is the classic private company owner, entrepreneur, Alberta based, folks that are making it happen. They are driving a living uh, for their families. They are taking the risk. They're paying tax. They are employing Albertans and uh, they own the risk and they own the reward. 
So both families of Ophelia and Rosencrantz draw down a T4 based income, uh, plus or minus 100K per year. And depending on the economic and financial performance of the private company, both might be able to extract some dividend income. And they would look to, to the good folks at Aiken Henderson to help them control the throttle and the break of that dividend income year over year and how they're going to reinvest, how they're going to um, consider the growth in their private companies. And as with every private company owner entrepreneur on this call, um, not to be omnipotent or, or self-absorbed, but guess what? The success of the day-to-day -day operations of this business is absolutely reliant that Ophelia and Rosencrantz show up every day, lead, run, manage. And uh, it just is. That's just the way that this private company works. So a couple of bits of uh, economic information and a bit more of a view into this case study. Both Ophelia and Rosencrantz have put in their own capital of $150,000 each in various segments of shareholder loans up until this point. So again, uh, Ophelia's family and Rosencrantz's family, 150K each, total 300. There's nine employees full time that um, are economically dependent on the success of this private venture. Um, they are in growth mode and future growth is largely going to be funded by some bank debt. And as with all private company owners, when we're in front of the great folks in the lending organizations, additional shareholders loans will be required as well will be personal guarantees. Ipso facto, that's going to happen. A bit about the the nature of the business on, you know, values. And again, this isn't meant to be clinical. These are, um, uh, you know, what's the business worth type values. So the land and buildings in which the business makes uh, their livings effectively is uh, just over a million dollars. And the business, if it were to be sold today, the value of the business would be worth another one point two million dollars. So we want to look at the economic and emotional risk to Legacy Co and uh, each individual family. And this is where it gets personal. So, you know, just want to recap each family. So Ophelia's family and Rosencrantz's family are dependent on the core income of Ophelia and Rosencrantz. Uh, their respective spouses don't work. They're in, you know, high functioning parent mode, looking after the two young children at home. Uh, each family has about 150K in shareholders loans. The value of the business is plus or minus 2.5 million land and uh, opco value. Um, I want you to consider the impact to the day to day operations if Rosencrantz or Ophelia aren't able to be there, as well the impact to the personal guarantees um, that the bank is going to require that uh, they make personally in order to fund that growth in the form of debt. Uh, we're on to the next slide here. So this is where it gets very personal and this is this goes back to our purpose statement. Our purpose at Dabosky is the economic and emotional risk that a private company owner or an entrepreneur or a family run business undertakes or absorbs or or owns and um, you know Dubosky's relationship with this organization, uh, it started off small and it started off as a as a basic relationship in that they needed the ability to, to repay the shareholders loans and fund the monies uh, back to the organ back to the individual home uh, back to the individual shareholders Rosencrantz and Ophelia in the form of income replacement. So what this specific family put in place, what these two families put in place was key person, corporate held, life insurance, um, and a part of the shareholders agreement, which Clayton will speak to in a moment, it was to fund the buy sell portion. The life insurance was to fund the interruption uh, of a missing shareholder, as in cash to help the business um, carry on if either Rosencrantz or Ophelia were not with us anymore. Uh, it also uh, would fund the buy-sell and or 
the replenishment of the individual family shareholders loans. Clayton, I want to take a look at uh, and open this up to to you and Dustin uh, for some for some commentary and some questions on uh, tax treatment, if we can, please, Clayton. Clayton, I think you're muted. I'm not sure. Yeah, we, I, hopefully we don't have to remind each other of that much during this session. But um, <laughs> anyways, I mean, that 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 case study uh, really rings true for me. You know, at Aiken Henderson, for example, there's three partners, um, Carol, George and Clayton. And, you know, if Clayton gets knocked out uh, for whatever reason, be it a disability um, or a critical illness or, you know, God forbid, be it I perish um, in a tragic biking accident or something. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if me not being present would have a very big impact on the business, but certainly Carol or George, um, you know, that would have a major impact on the business. And so you need to think about that stuff. Um, and so when we're talking about buy sell insurance, you'd mentioned we have that in place at Aiken Henderson for the partners, because if if one of us goes, um, you know, effectively, unless it's set up properly, the other two could end up in business with somebody they don't want to be. Right. Uh, they, you know, George and George and Carol could end up in business with with my wife or um, we could end up in business with one of their spouses. And so having a, an adequate USA and an adequate policy to sort of contemplate that is really paramount to any partner type relationship. Um, in addition to the actual funding needs of, of, you know, how do we take care of your family in times of in these, you know, in, in times of peril effectively, right? So, um, you know, before we get into the tax, I just wanted to say, you know, we, we do that and we, you know, it's, it, it's really, really relevant, so. Okay. And, and yeah. Dustin, your thoughts at this stage? Yeah, the, the one comment that I would make, Chris, is that um, for people listening, you know, the, the buy-sell coverage is really meant to uh, reflect the fair market value of the shares. And that's, that money uh, is really meant to go out to the deceased estate. And the key person coverage is meant to uh, stay in the, uh, in the corporation and fund, um, fund future growth, bring on potentially a new partner. And, you know, one important component of all that is that the shareholders agreement should uh, reflect and contemplate and align with uh, the insurance planning that's done. That's a really important component. So um, I'll jump in and tell you a scenario where that is, you know, extremely paramount. So you might have a USA that doesn't directly address the policy other than it says you have to have one to buy you know, the estate has to buy you out of that company, I think is what we're contemplating here. Mm. Well, the, the there's a tax impact of when the life insurance policy proceeds come into a private company, they come into what's called the capital dividend account. And that is a mechanism within a private company to allow those funds to be distributed out of the company without attracting tax. And so when a life insurance policy triggers and gets paid into a private company, it can it gets distributed out effectively to the estate to buy out the estate. You know, Dustin, have I got that right so far? Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, an interesting scenario here is if it's not directly contemplated in the USA that that capital dividend account be used to distribute funds to the estate, it is, it, it is there's a potential that the remaining shareholders could distribute a taxable dividend to the estate and be within their rights to do so under the normal um, rules of the corporation and how they pay dividends and keep that tax-free dividend account for themselves. Um, I have seen this happen once. It was very unfortunate and there was a lot of, there was, there was contention between the shareholders, not saying that there has to be contention. It can be a lot of money and it can be uh, pretty significant. So to avoid putting yourself in that position when there's a life insurance buy sell type agreement in place, you want to make sure that it is buttoned up properly within the USA. And Clayton, that's a that's a great point. As as value in the organization grows, um, you know, Calgary is a classic example. Um, Fourteen years ago, when Rosencrantz and Ophelia began the business, the land was a lower value. The share price, or the share value, or the fair market value of the organization was a lower value. And as it grew, you know, as did their responsibility to their nine 
employees, as did, their, as did their responsibility to the community for the contributions that they make, as did their responsibility to their own respective families. And the risk that their families took on and continue to take on is, is you know, where, where we come in and where we work up close with the good folks at Aiken Henderson. So as uh, Clayton and Ronnie and members of the Aiken Henderson team are planning their, their annual taxation and their future taxation planning, they will be asking about, you know, where are you with your shareholders agreement? When was it last refreshed? Uh, does it contemplate, you know, the future in the next 14 years that you plan to be in business together? And certainly insurance planning, um, you know, put another way, the shareholders agreement in this capacity is to a large degree a corporate will. And, um, the, you know, the last point that I want to make on case study number one for Legacy Services Co. is that there's an opportunity for both Rosencrantz and Ophelia and their respective families to have a, a well-planned personal will. And of course, to refresh and consider uh, tax planning and insurance planning in alignment with the, the general advice that they're getting from uh, Clayton and his partners. Uh, so that, you know, it reduces and lowers the economic risk to the corporation, those employees, and, uh, and in this case, you know, certainly the families that have invested heavily their personal dollars. Um, so that was our objective was to take a look at why corporate health insurance would be put in place on Rosencrantz and Ophelia, how corporate health insurance would uh, cover off key person funding the buy sell uh, repatriation of shareholders loans to the families uh, income replacement as both Rosencrantz and Ophelia their family situation is they were the income earners and uh, the other spouse were you know focused on uh, core parenting so Clayton, I want to move on to the next one. Chris, or any final before, on? yeah, just one final thought. You know, I'm always thinking about uh, my partners, and I had and I had mentioned previously how they don't want to be in business with whoever uh, secedes me in terms of my uh, estate. Uh, but really, I got to think about my family here too, right? Would my family rather have a pile of cash equal to the fair value of my share in my business, or would they? like to have an ownership stake where they have to become operationally involved in a company that they may or may not know anything about. Well, and that's you know, it. So. That's it. I mean, you know, it, I'm sure the people on the call have heard the term accidental partnership or accidental business um, partners. You know, Veronica Day, who I love very much, uh, I think she's a great spouse, but I don't know that Dustin Daniel and Ben Fortier or our other equity partner in Edmonton <laughs> want to be in business with Veronica Day every day. Uh, and so our shareholders agreement is, is very similar. We have buy sell coverage in our shareholders agreement so that if I go missing or don't make it back from a bike ride in, on Highway 40 on a Sunday, that the life insurance pays into the corporation. The shareholders agreement is really simple. It pays out the estate. So it pays out Veronica Day in this case, and it also funds, you know, Dustin and Ben to carry on because now Chris is missing and there's an economic implication of that. And that, and so Clayton, to your point, that is spoken to in the shareholders agreement. Yeah. Of how those funds will be used. And uh, I would invite uh, those on the call to contemplate the shareholders agreement, um, you know, Dustin, uh, and Dabosky as a routine review the shareholders agreement in detail when we are helping private company owners, entrepreneurs and family run business with their insurance planning. That's often where we start you know, or it's very early in the inventory of uh, components and documents and instruments that we want to, and need to look at in order to in order for for qualified individuals like Dustin to provide advice and uh, getting up close to the shareholders agreement. I can't stress it enough. If you're looking at it once every two to three years, it's not enough. Um, pull it, review it, talk about it, put it on the agenda with your shareholders, put it on the agenda with Clayton, put it on the agenda with the partners at Aiken Henderson to speak about so that you can consider tax implications of it, values that may have changed and treatment of how the, the 
the benefit flows in and mo most importantly flows out in a tax effective manner. Perfect, thanks. Clayton, we're going to move on if, if uh, that's OK. And uh, questions are welcome at the end. Um, and we can certainly flip back to these. Sorry, yeah, point on that, guys. Questions to the right, key them in as we go. Um, we can queue them up and have a list and we'll get to them. Uh, we'll get to them in a bit. So ask, fire away with all your questions. Okay. And Clayton, I'm not able to see those. So if they come up, would you be so kind as to share them with Dustin and I? I will moderate the Q&A, absolutely. Very good, thank you. So Professional Services Co., another classic Alberta family legacy business. Um, you know, Dustin and I and our partner Ben in Edmonton would spend all of our day in front of organizations like Legacy Co. and Professional Services Co. Uh, in the service of entrepreneurs, this is, you know, a, well, a real case study. Names of the innocent have been withheld. So, two founders married, early 60s. Uh, they began their career in this business and they are very close to completing, winding up, and, and or exiting their career in this business. Uh, the two founders, uh, spouses, have one uh, adult child in the business, and they have one adult child not in the business. Uh, a sale to a third party is a possibility, as there are suitors that have presented themselves, so is family succession to the one um, family member, the one Gen 2 uh, adult child that's been working in the business for some time. So here's where um, the story goes from, you know, go capitalism, go family run business, go, go, go entrepreneurial spirit. And this is where uh, Dustin and I start to feel sick. And so do your advisors at Aiken Henderson. So they have not um, they've been focused on the business, like a great many good quality entrepreneurs and client service folks are. They are all about client service, client service quality, the client, the customer, the client, the customer. And that's what's made them successful. So uh, in this case, we're not going to look at dollar values, but I just want you to zoom out a bit and on a less clinical view. Like many private company owners that are family, uh, their family has funded the business, their family has been a part of the business. So the bulk of their net worth is held in a holding company with which both of the spouses who are active in the business own equally. The holding company owns the main operating co. And in the holding company, they have some equity investments. The holding company also owns the land in which the business uh, lives in and operates out of. And the holding company owns the value of the business, the value of the shares effectively. Um, the one uh, adult child that's in the business is not an owner. Um, the two founders want to consider a legacy forward family foundation with philanthropic investment in the Calgary area. It's very important to them. And as they're looking at their success economically, they want this to be a part of their family and they want this to be a part of their family name, and they want this philanthropic investment to uh, be in the form of a foundation that carries on for many years to come. So, um, this is where urgent and important uh, does not do well with lack of planning on the business. So, they haven't been clients of Aiken Henderson. They haven't been clients of Dubosky. Um, they've been focused on their business. Their wills, I'm starting at the bottom two slides and we'll work, or the bottom two bullet points and we'll work up. Their will, personally, their personal directives and their power of attorneys are not complete. They haven't been discussed. Um, their tax planning is, you know, their tax planning is they pay the tax. Um, and if you're a tax advisor or you're a tax-minded entrepreneur, uh, you should be feeling a bit worried for them, and we are too. Their estate planning, their insurance planning, their succession and or sale planning is also underthought, under-advised, under-discussed, and under-communicated. Now, this is where, you know, sadly that is common, but this is where it becomes compounded. 
one of the founders has now uncertain an uncertain health profile. Uh, they are in in a series of doctor's appointments, and the news is either going to be very good or very bad. So they do have term life and critical illness insurance in force on both of the founders. Uh, the holding company is the owner and the beneficiary of the specific coverage. So this type of um, lack of contemplation, lack of planning, lack of working on the business um, is, is going to be compounded greatly uh, because of the uncertain health future. So Clayton, I wanted to invite you and Dustin in uh, on this. Um, um, you know, the classic private company entrepreneur, the bulk of their the bulk of their net worth is is tied into that that holding co and vis a vis, you know, their performance and their future shareholders performance and the operating company. Generally, yeah. Um, and Dustin uh, opening like, you know, what's a bright spot that you see here in this this profile? Yeah, <clears throat> Chris, certainly um having existing coverage in place and having that coverage in the hold co um, is that is certainly a bright spot um, if they were to you know if they were to sell the business it would seem as though hold co would be um would be would remain for the family and um you know the ability to uh, convert those term life policies uh, potentially is is something of value and would certainly they'd certainly want to explore that okay and you know the other component here um you know we like this profile to some degree because there is there has been a very small amount of insurance planning i.e they have something in place and in this in this specific setup the folks at aiken henderson would in five minutes be able to calculate the terminal tax liability. And uh, Clayton, if you could speak upon deem disposition and you know effectively how that in, in Canada we don't have a state tax, but if you can if you can speak about yes. you know if there were to be if both shareholders were to pass, you know what would be the tax treatment of these corporate held assets to the uh, the philanthropic pursuits forward, the family. Uh, equalization amongst the shareholder or amongst the family member that's in the business and then one family member that's not in the business. Um, yeah, so I mean, when when you when you pass away, you're deemed to have disposed of everything, um, notwithstanding in, under a scenario where you've got a spouse, you know, in this scenario uh, where you could roll those two. So, you know, the full value of the of the shares would would uh, would pass to the spouse but if they both you know again if they both perished you've got a taxable event right right yeah, yeah and, and and so the, the the one bright spot here is that because the term insurance is in place and in force um uh, a they have coverage and b should they wish the economic utility of conversion is available for them um the critical illness that is in place uh simply put if you know that health uncertain health path proves to to show a critical illness upon um, diagnosis uh, through the through the claim period you know there's a possibility that critical illness insurance would pay uh, which would provide some liquidity uh, for them to consider and work hard on either the succession or the sale which will take work and will take advice and will take a life of its own in meetings and in time with advisors and the future buyers. So that's one bright spot in this in this case study um, from our high self-interest position is that there is some workable uh, financial instruments, i.e. term life insurance and critical illness that are in place um, and that can provide some economic relief and vis-a-vis -vis emotional relief to the family and to the business. So, you know, again, um, we would work up close with uh, the tax advisors at Aiken Henderson. We would work up close with the legal advisor. Hopefully there is one. 
and encourage uh, those conversations uh, within our process of insurance planning um, around wills and the personal directive and the power of attorney. Uh, Dustin, um, feel free to interject here, but ultimately, you know, a part of our process is is in and around that. Your comments? Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly, we would, uh, you know, we'd want to look at the at the whole picture. Um, based on based on this scenario, um, like for example, if they had personally held insurance, beneficiary designations, reviewing all that, um, uh, and making sure that that aligns with the will. Does you know if there's personally held insurance, does it go to the estate and get distributed via the will, or does it go directly to a named individual or individuals? Um, on the on the corporate side. Um, you know, if the hold co is the owner, it's going to be the beneficiary of the insurance. And so then the will comes into play, um, you know, after there's, um, you know, once the estate effectively kind of controls that hold co. Thank you. And, so and Dustin, I, I, Clay, this, this back back to you, there's 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 a, a significant and material philanthropic um, organizational personal values within the family and uh, they have intention to make material contributions to largely start up and fund a family foundation. Uh, Dustin and Clay, some of your thoughts on insurance planning relative to charitable giving. Yeah, you know, from my perspective, life insurance is a way to multiply your money, first of all. So like, like if we're just looking at it from that perspective, um, you know, you may have a million dollars worth of assets that you could donate and get a huge tax benefit for, by the way, um, which sort of can offset the uh, um, offset the, the tax triggered upon uh, deeming to have disposed of your your business when you die. With a life insurance policy, you can multiply that effect. Um, and so, you know, you take a bit of your million, um, invest into a life insurance policy and, and multiply the effect of it from a charitable perspective. And when you're doing that, actually, you also, um, you also um, get, get more of a tax benefit effectively because the money that you're receiving to donate to that charity comes out tax-free through the CDA. So, uh, Dustin, you can go a bit deeper on that. Um, yeah, well, I guess the, the one... One comment that I will make is that we have, you know, we have seen in uh, in the past where clients have a, you know, somewhat related to this, but they have a term insurance policy that they've had for a long time and they might be considering uh, canceling it or um, even if there's been a health issue and they, they don't need the insurance, that insurance policy could have a fair market value and it could actually be donated to a charitable organization or their own um, private family foundation and they could get a donation receipt um, in exchange for the fair market value of that policy. So there are some pretty um, interesting things that can be done with insurance and, uh, and philanthropy. So I got a question from Craig here. Maybe we'll pass this one to Dustin because it's a good one on topic. You touched on deemed disposition if both spouses die. So is a joint last to die policy within the corporate structure also beneficial or recommended? Um, yeah, like from a, you know, on the, on the face of it, certainly from a timing perspective, uh, when, when the tax is triggered after both spouses have passed, uh, certainly, um, having a policy that aligns with that, where it pays out when the tax is due, uh, does does make sense. Um, if they, you know, if getting a new policy in this situation due to health issues would would prove uh, not to work, um, then you know they'd be they'd have to, you know, work with what they already have um, for existing term coverage. Yeah. All right. Chris Clayton I but I just wanted to add some you know context to the to the deemed disposition 
if you could walk them, let's say, let's say a private company owner didn't use insurance or didn't have it, and they they, they had let's say a one hundred dollar tax bill on the deemed dis disposition after both primary founders have died, and you know the estate had to take effectively some form of income, pay tax, and then pay the tax bill. Could you walk us through the tax implications of of you know basically liquidating corporate held wealth and the tax process, the two step tax process before it it gets to be a check payable to the CRA? Yeah, so in our base case scenario, um, you you know you die, maybe both spouses perish. Let's say your company is worth um, whatever it's worth. You get you deem to have disposed of it. That triggers a capital gain. You're going to pay capital gains tax on that disposition. Um, or it's going to trigger capital gains tax. Well, now you need to, the estate, when I saying you, I mean the estate now needs to pay the tax on that capital gain. In order to get the money to pay the tax on that capital gain, it has to extract cash from the company. And so how that happens is um, generally results in a liquidation of assets within the company, which may or may not be the best thing. Maybe the company's going concern, you want to keep it keep it operational, whatever, uh, but freeing up that cash can be problematic. and once you have freed up the cash of the company, it has to come out to the estate, uh, which attracts more tax. And so you end up in a in a pretty bad situation. Now there are planning mechanisms for post-mortem planning where we can um, sort of avoid double taxation, uh, but certainly you still end up in a taxable position where um, you, you, a cash negative position where you might not be had you otherwise planned for it using life insurance. Um, you know, we, we would, do some post-mortem planning to make sure there isn't double taxation, and then a life insurance policy would trigger to come in and cover that tax. Dustin, you want to add some meat to those bones? Um, yeah, like, I mean, we, uh, you know, we would look at it in, like, if you have a, a corporate-owned policy, you've got, you're paying the premiums with corporate after-tax dollars, um, but, you know, when the policy pays out, um, for the most part, there is a calculation there, but uh, for the most part, the insurance benefit would be uh, credited to the capital dividend account. So the, you know, one of the uh, kind of the great things about corporate owned insurance is that you've you've paid the, the premiums with corporate after tax dollars, not personal after tax, uh, but by and large, that insurance, those insurance proceeds can still go out to the estate in a tax preferred basis. And and Clayton, you touched on this. Uh, urgently selling land, um, long term equity, or certainly yeah. trying to urgently sell a private company. Ur ur urgently selling land. I love that. Yeah. Like it's so, you know, there, there's there's no good time to urgently sell any of these, <laughs> these, no. these, these, these material assets. And so no, when you do you're sitting on does stocks have or, something urgently, yeah. it, it doesn't often result in, you know, uh, an economic benefit or it can just it, it just it's just really bad. We just don't that's like a, to see that's it. a great that's a great point, Chris, like timing is everything. And if you need to free up cash right now and your only option is a fire sale on the land that your building has been your your, your parents building has been sitting on. I mean, you're going to end up with lower proceeds than you wanted. Right. And uh, so really, you know, again, yeah, the, the insurance component buys you some time. So yeah, so, yeah I mean, it, yes, it's this is what we do. This is the, the financial in instrument in which we advise and how we make our livings. Uh, so we understand it, we get it, and we're we're fans of it. Uh, I'm also just a fan of uh, <laughs> risk reduction. I don't like a lot of risk, and I don't like a lot of wear and tear on the emotions that go into private company ownership, because there's enough market pressure, pressure from employees, pressure from government, pressure from unforeseen uh, environmental circumstances such that we're in right now that make private company ownership difficult at best, and. Uh, that goes back to our purpose and why you know we're thankful that that you had us here today, uh, um, Clayton, and we're thankful for that. And I want to just wind up. I want to be respectful of people's time. We're coming up on ten minutes to the hour. If there's any further questions uh, from your guests, uh, Dustin and I would be happy to answer them. I want to thank you both for for taking the time to uh, go through these two base cases. Hopefully, it adds some clarity for some of the attendees. 
Um, if you have any questions about it, we'll we'll send out a follow up video and uh, and links to everybody's contact information afterwards. So, okay, thank you, Clayton. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Aiken Henderson, and for the guests that are on the call, we sincerely appreciate your time. Uh, in closing, if you have any questions from us, you know you're welcome to reach out to us directly. If you'd like a copy of the Anderson report, which typically comes out uh, last few days of the business month. Um, if you're a reader of the of financial or economic reporting, uh, be it in the Calgary Herald, the National Post, the Globe and Mail, or your business to a large degree is in a relationship with a large neighbor to our south, i.e. the United States of America, uh, you'll find the reporting of value. It is, uh, it is old school, written two, three page report, uh, written by an economist for those that take the risk in private company ownership. So that's available to you and that would be uh, with compliments. Mm -hmm.